to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Let's prepare our hearts to hear from the Holy Spirit, because you didn't come to hear from me. Didn't come to hear from any other man or woman. No, this is about hearing from God. So let's prepare our hearts. If you would, stand to your feet, and I'm going to get down on my knees, and let's go before the Lord together in prayer. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, and Lord, we're so grateful that we get to come into your house and experience your presence. How grateful we are, Lord, for the blood. How grateful we are for our Savior, Jesus Christ. And God, tonight, we approach with respect and reverence and and just a holy awe and fear who you are, God. We we love you, Lord, And, and tonight, as we approach the blood, God, we just recognize the Lordship of Jesus Christ God, we, we want to come and be changed, and anybody who encounters your blood, Lord, can't help but be changed. We thank you, Father God, that it's been sprinkled on our hearts, God, cleansing us and purifying us. And so tonight, we pray that you would open our eyes to see and our ears to hear, open our hearts to understand your word, Father God. Lord, all these thoughts and all these notes, all the words that are going to be spoken tonight, Holy Spirit, we pray that you come and make sense of them all, that you come and give us your thoughts. Show us your ways tonight, Lord. And Father, we'll give you all the glory and honor and praise. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves, but also we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. We pray that you bless them as you bless us this night. Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say Amen. 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 You can have a seat. Tonight we're continuing our series on the blood. This is part number two, and you remember part number one, we talked about being blood-bought. Tonight we're going to examine what it means to be blood-bathed. Last week we saw how we were purchased, how we were blood-bought, and how Jesus didn't barter, Jesus didn't bargain. No, he paid full price for you and I. And tonight... We're going to take a look at what it means to be blood bathed. Oftentimes you'll hear people talk about you were cleansed by the blood or you were washed in the blood. We were blood bathed. Now what does that mean to you and I? Well, not only as we just examine, this is not just about examining the word and taking a look into or peering into something. No, this is about you and I not just staying to that point of looking at something, but not having it change or affect our lives. No, as as we examine, we're also going to get our hands dirty. We're, we're going to get involved in it. We're, we're going to get blood all over us. We're going to be affected. There's going to be a change. What does that mean? That means that we're going to experience something tonight as we look at the Word. As the Word of God comes into our heart, the Bible says that it's like a double-edged sword piercing and dividing, that, that, that it reveals things and, it, and it, it exposes things within us. And you know, anytime there's a sword that pierces through the flesh, what's going to happen? Blood's going to spill out. And so as we examine the Word of God, the Word of God really is going to examine us. And as we experience the Word of God tonight, we're going to walk away from this place changed. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Revelation, chapter number 7. We're going to read a couple verses in Revelation, chapter number 7, talking about being blood-bathed. What does it mean when we say that we're washed by the blood, cleansed by the blood? What does that mean when we see those things? Revelation, chapter number 7 We're going to take a look at verse number 13 and verse number 14. The Apostle John is seeing a great multitude in heaven, there before the Lamb, clothed in white. Verse number 13, then one of the elders answered, saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? Verse 14, and I said to him, sir, you know. See, oftentimes when we're asked a question, we feel like we need to have the answer. We feel like we need to come up with something or produce something or, or, you know, I'll find out or whatever it is. But John was wise enough to know that he was experiencing something that was out of his league. He was in a realm of the spirit. He, He was experiencing heaven. It's almost as if God just pulled the curtain back for a moment and showed him a glimpse of glory, of what was going on in heaven. Eternal realities and principles that we see at play in our life today and in the future, things to come. And so here he is, and he sees this great multitude arrayed in white robes before the Lamb, and, and, and the elder comes to him and says, who are, who are these people dressed in white? And he says, sir, you know, I don't know. I, I, I'm here getting a picture of this. I, I've only been here a little while checking things out. You know who they are. Let's read on and see what he says. 
Verse 14, I said to him, sir, you know, so he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. Now, hold on right, right there for a second. A lot of times people think, oh, well, then this is future tense because great tribulation, that's coming in the future. Things are, you know, going to take place and then this is going to happen and that's going to happen and, you know, there's rapture, there's this and that, you know, and they got this timeline. So these are people in the future coming out of the great tribulation. Well, that's fine if, if that's how you, you know, break down the word. But when you take a look at that, these are the ones who came out of great tribulation, who come out of the great tribulation. If you look at the original word, it's not just come out like a, they, they, it was a past tense thing. No, it's a, it's a present thing that's taking place continuously. They are coming out of. They are continually coming out of great tribulation. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. See, there's tribulations, there's pressures, there's things that each and every one of us as Christians are going to go through. And that tribulation you know, sometimes people think of it as a future event, but if you ask people in, in parts of the world that are under persecution, you ask them, are they in the great tribulation? They will say, oh, yes, we are. We're experiencing it right now. Our loved ones are being taken to prisons. People are being beheaded. There's great persecution coming. See, in, in, in our church in America, we're very sheltered from those things. We don't realize that there's pastors being hung up in their churches and, and then having their churches being burnt to the ground. We don't realize that those things are taking place, that people, because they've said yes to Jesus, now have found themselves in a prison, not able to provide for their family. See, there's a great tribulation going on on the earth right now. And so when he looks at these people arrayed in white robes before the Lamb, and he says, who are these? He says, sir, you know, these are the ones coming out of, they are coming out of, there's a, there's a number that's rolling into these, they're coming out of great tribulation. Now let's see what else about them we can find out. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, I don't know about you, but I thought about this verse and I, I take a look at that and I said they washed their robes and made them white, how? In the blood of the Lamb. Now, let me ask you something. Is, is blood white? No. What color is blood? Red, right? And yet in the book of Isaiah, God, speaking prophetically, says, though your sins be as scarlet, red, I will make them white as snow. Hmm. This seems to be the opposite. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They took their robes and they submerged them into the blood, and when they took them out of the blood, they weren't red, they were now white. What's happening? What's going on? What's taking place that this blood could make a robe white? See, this is no ordinary blood. This is not blood as you and I know it here on the earth. This is not the stuff that's running through our veins. No, this is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is not just a natural thing we're talking about. Remember, this is a picture of heaven that the apostle is seeing here in the book of Revelation. And when we take a look at the effect of the blood of Jesus spiritually in heaven, we find out that those who take their robe and wash them in the blood of the Lamb, when they pull them out, they're white as snow. What does that mean? Robe. Well, the robe in those days identified, you could identify a person by looking at their robe. You could see that there was a beggar over there. Why? Because he was robed in dirty clothes and he had a beggar's robe on. You see this with Bartimaeus who when he went to follow Jesus, what did he do? He cast aside his beggar's garment, right? Thus, no longer identifying himself with begging any longer. Uh, how, how about the prodigal son? When the prodigal son finally came back to his father, what was he? He was dirty, he was nasty, he had no shoes, he smelt like pigs, right? And, and he was a couple pounds lighter because he hadn't been eating. So he's emaciated. There he is, coming to his father, head down. He had his speech all prepared. And what does his father do? Sees him afar off, runs up, hugs on him. What does he do? He puts a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, and his robe on him. What is he doing? He's identifying him. This is my son. This is like me here. Kings in those days and royalty, they, they wore robes of blue or of purple. 
You could identify somebody who had wealth or influence by their robe. See, these people coming out of the great tribulation, they had washed their robe, they had took who they are, their identity, everything that represented them, the whole person there, and they took that and they submerged it into the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And though their sins were as scarlet, though their robes may have looked dirty, though it may have looked like the beggar's robe, Though it may have been brown and stained and and, and just nasty and reeked of things of this world, when they submerged it in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and they, they let it take place, when they let it do its work and they lifted those robes out, it came out white as snow. This is no ordinary blood. Many cleaners today, you, you hear of them on the television, right? You've got the, the, the guys that are, are trying to pitch you an item, trying to get you to call this number now. If you call in the next eight seconds or less, you'll get the double bonus barrel, right? And what do they always say? They say, it's so tough, it works on dirt and grass stains and blood. You get blood on a shirt? Oh, man. I'm going to go see if I can get that, you know, boost clean or whatever it is. You know, I'm going to get that super max durable, uh, 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 you know, lift off, whatever it is. What, what, what's that doing? It, it's going to go and get a hold of that stuff. And it's got the bubbling action and all those other things, right? And it gets a hold of it and it lifts that stain off. In the same way, when we come to Jesus, we may have something that we think was irreparable. Though your sins are as scarlet. We mess up and we think, God, I, I, I don't understand, God, how can this ever get taken care of? God, do you see how dirty this is? Do you see what I did? And, and, and God, I didn't just, you know, some of this stuff, these spots and these stains here, you know, they, they just happen naturally. But God, this one over here, I did this. I did this willingly, Lord. Wait, wait a second, what about this up here, God? I mean, this, this was brought on, I, I was being foolish. God, I knew better. And yet I still entered in. What, 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 what do you do with this, God? And God says, bring it to me. Put it under the blood. And it will cleanse. It will wash. It will lift that stain right off. See, natural blood gives us a picture of this in the natural realm. Our blood, if you, if you study our blood out, you know that the blood in the human body will gather impurities and things that, that, that are contaminating the body. Things that would pollute your system. And your natural blood will get a hold of those things and it will send it away to organs in your body that will take care of those things and expel them from the body. It'll be as if those things were never there. Why? Because the blood gets a hold of it and it cleanses your body. It sends it away to a place, to an organ in your body that will eliminate those things, those pollutants. The same way the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ gets a hold of those things that are impurities in our life and it sends it away to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ where it can be taken care of. You're there in Revelation. Turn uh, back towards the front of your Bible a, a couple of books to 1 John. Let's take a look at how it does this. 1 John chapter number 1. 1 John chapter number 1, verse number 7. 1 John chapter 1, verse number 7. Take a look at it with me. 1 John 1, 7 says these words. It says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Right there we see that cleansing power of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now take a look at verse eight. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. What is he saying? He said, you say you don't have any sin, you're a liar. You say you never messed up? Uh Uh-uh. I've read the Bible. It says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible says I was looking for one, just one, who was righteous. Couldn't find a single one on the earth. Why? Because everybody messed up. Everybody has entered into sin. You see why? Because we've got that terminal pollutant inside of us called sin. It was passed down from our father and from our father's father and from their father all the way back to Adam. 
And because he had entered into sin, it was passed on in the bloodline of man. And each and every one of us has that terminal pollutant, that terminal blood disease that runs through our veins. And as we live in the flesh, we're going to mess up. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But praise God that he didn't stop there at verse number 8 and just say, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself, the truth is not in you. In other words, if you say you're not a sinner, you're a liar. Look at verse number 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's that cleansing word again. So what does he say? If we confess our sins, in other words, if we bring it out into the light. We started in verse number 7, if we walk in the light, right? So he says, if we confess, what does that mean? That means that we acknowledge it. We, we confront it head on. We, we don't try and sweep it under the rug. No, we bring it out into the light and we say, God, I screwed up. God, I messed up. God, look at what I did. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 7 cleanses us from all sin. And in verse number 9, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How does he do that? But by his blood. So as you are living your life, even as a Christian, because sometimes we think, man, I gave my heart and my life to Jesus Christ and I don't know what's wrong, I'm still messing up. The, the same stuff that I dealt with before I was a Christian, I'm dealing with now after being a Christian. But listen, as you confess those things, bring it into the light, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now that does not give you a license to continue to sin because it's going to be cleansed. See, it's your responsibility after you confess it and receive that forgiveness and that cleansing to do everything in your power and to link up with the grace of God to transform you from the inside out so that you don't continue in that sin and to do it over and over and over and over and over again. That's why you get into the word. That's why you get accountability. That's why you continue to confess. That's why you put, put up things that will, that will, that will stop you, things that will hold you accountable, things that will, will keep you from sin. It's like somebody said, man, I keep messing up, going to the bar. Well, stay out of the bar. Every time I go to the club, bad things happen. Don't go to the club. Stay away from those places. But if you mess up, you can confess it, bring it to light. Hey, Lord, look, look at what happened here. God, I, I, I confess this to you. And, and, and Lord, I know from your word that you're faithful and just to forgive me. God, I just plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ over this sin. Please forgive me. And God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. Let's read on. Verse number 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. See, we, we have to acknowledge these things. We have to say, that's it. We have to confront it. We have to confess it to God. We have to bring it up. We have to say, Lord, this is where I'm at. God, this is what's real. This is, this is the raw, this is just me. Bible says that everything's naked and exposed before him anyways, and we got to give an account to him anyways. So listen, this is not confessing something to God and God's up in heaven going, oh, oh my goodness, you did what? Hold on. Michael, can you believe this? No, see, God's not doing that. God already knows that you messed up. He already sees all. He, he, he's already seen what you've done. He, he's not worried about it. He's not taking Prozac or going to counseling over it. No, God's already provided his blood... And therefore, we have to bring it up and confess it. Otherwise, we make him out to be a liar. And his word is not in us. Verse number, uh, verse number one of chapter two. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. Everybody say may not. Yeah. See, this is where we're learning. This is our process. This is the process of growth. We all know that we have sin. We all know that we will mess up as we go through life. But I write these things to you so that you may not sin. In other words, when you start getting these sins confessed and out into the light, you start walking in the light as he is in the light, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin, and as you move forward, you see the choice. 
You see the stains. You see there's a mud hole over there. And if I go walking through that, this nice clean white robe that I'm wearing, it's going to get messy. And so I'm going to stay away from that path and I'm going to walk the Lord's path. The highway of holiness. So that you may not sin. But praise God for the rest of the verse. And if anyone sins, if you're walking along and you happen to find yourself in that mud hole, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous. In other words, Jesus is your advocate. He's on your side. If you think about an advocate in legal terms, he, he's your public defender. He's the one that's going to come and plead your case before the Father. And what's he going to say? He's going to say, Father, they messed up. It's true. But my blood cleanses them from all sin. That's my child. And when God looks at them, he's going to see a robe that's been washed in blood, in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number two, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now, I would imagine that all of us read through that, and we all said, and he himself is the propitiation. What in the world does that mean? For our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. I understood everything in that verse except one word, and oftentimes when we do that, we skip over it and we continue on. And hopefully I'll understand something down the road. But God doesn't want us to skip over things like this. God wants us to take note of these things. He himself is the propitiation. Not a word that we use in our everyday lingo, our everyday terminology. What does propitiation mean? I haven't asked anybody recently, how, how are you doing with Propitiation. It's not a word that we encounter that often. When you read in the Bible, you find out that this word propitiation is only in the Bible a couple of times. You're only going to find it based on your translation maybe three or four times in your Bible. You will see the propitiation. There's another term that you find for propitiation. It can be used interchangeably, and that's this word called mercy seat. You say, well, Pastor Dan, thank you for explaining what that means to me, but I still have no clue what you're talking about. Because when I read that verse and I say, and he himself is the mercy seat for our sins, and not only for ours only, but also for the whole world, I get a better picture of that, but what's the mercy seat? It sounds good. Mercy sounds nice. I like that. Mercy seat. That's interesting. What's going on here? Well, in order to understand what this really means, we need to unlock it through the book of Hebrews, chapter number nine. Go there with me. Hebrews chapter number nine. Let's find out about this together. Everybody doing okay? I haven't put anyone to sleep yet, have I? Praise God. You know what? I, I think we'll just keep going tonight and we'll just, you know, whenever we're done, we're done. So maybe in two or three days we can... Get back to normal life. <laughs> Hebrews chapter number nine, starting in verse number one. Hebrews chapter nine, verse number one says, then indeed even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. So he's talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the time when Moses had set up the tabernacle, the tent in the wilderness. Okay, the children of Israel have been delivered from the bondage of Egypt. Now they are traveling there. They're going to the promised land and God sets up a sacrificial system. He sets up a priesthood. Moses' brother Aaron was the high priest. And so there was a picture on earth of something that was taking place in the heavenlies that foreshadowed Jesus Christ. In other words, this is the calling card by which God is explaining himself to you and I. When God shows us this picture, this is how he relates, this is how he explains, and this is how he joins himself to us. It's through this sacrificial system and eventually through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, when you take a look at this earthly sanctuary, this earthly picture, you're going to find out about something that's a spiritual reality in heaven. Verse number two, for a tabernacle, this tent, this big place in the wilderness was prepared. The first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Now, if you can think of a big rectangle, all right? Big rectangle. You got the big rectangle in your mind? Okay, now... About one-third of the way into that rectangle, draw a line, okay? Everybody got it? Now, in the big section on the, on the one side, you've got the first part. This first part contained a couple of items. 
the lampstand. Okay, so there was this golden lampstand that was fed by oil. They had to trim the wicks. They had to take care of this lampstand. They had to put the oil in, and they had to keep these candles burning. Okay, it was inside of a tent. Therefore, it needed light. A table and the showbread. So there was a little table that was in there, and it had bread. It had six pieces on this side, six pieces on this side. Okay, and that represented the 12 tribes of Israel, but it also represented the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Okay? And it said, which is called the sanctuary or the holy place. This was a holy place. Now, the priests would go in there daily, and they had services that they had to do in there daily. They had to trim the wicks. They had to take care of the lampstand. They had to go and make sure that the, the bread was on the table. They had, they had to have everything prepared just so. So the priests could go into this place. No one else, unless you were a priest, you couldn't go in there. But the priests had access into this place, and they had things that they were doing in their daily. Let's read on. Verse number three, and behind the second veil, so you remember, you had that big rectangle in your mind, and about one-third of the way in, you, you drew a line, right? We, we dealt with the big part, but now in the, behind the second part, there was a veil. There was this big, thick, impenetrable veil that was set up. Behind the second veil, behind that line, that little one-third portion in the back there, it says, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiness, holiest of all. See, the other part was the holy place. This is the holiest of all, the most holy place, or some translations say the holy of holies. And it says, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold. Now stop right there because we'll, we'll address the rest of this verse in a second. The golden censer, there was this little golden censer that had incense in it. What they would do is on the day of atonement or the day that they were going to take care of the sins of the nation, they would take the blood of the sacrifice from outside and they would bring that blood in and they would purify all the articles of the temple, right? They sprinkle the blood here, sprinkle the blood there, sprinkle it on the lampstand, sprinkle it on the table. And then they would come to this altar, this little altar of incense, right? And, and this little altar of incense, they would take it and, and they would sprinkle the blood onto the incense, and then they would wave it into that second veil behind there, into the holiest of all. Now, in the book of Revelation, the, the Bible tells us that the prayers of the saints rise like incense before the Lord. And why do they rise like incense before the Lord? Because Jesus Christ, by his blood, has given us access to God. So that high priest was foreshadowing something. He was saying that our prayers are made acceptable before God and we can enter into his presence by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody still tracking? So that was the golden censer. And then it says, and the Ark of the Covenant. How many of you remember that old movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark? Okay, bunch of you guys. For those of you guys that didn't see it, it's a fun movie. Uh, you know, old Hollywood stuff. But... They had a picture, and I thought it was a pretty cool picture that they had. If you remember, they were, they were searching for the lost ark, and they had this, this, this box, right? This golden box, and it had long poles that came off the sides, okay? And that was for the priest to pick it up because they couldn't touch the ark. And so they would walk it around, and, and so they would walk that with those poles, right? And, and then on the top of the ark, there was this big ornate cover. And on the top of that cover, there was two cherubim, two angels, right? And their wings were spread out over the top of that ark, they were covering the top part of the ark. Now, now, let's read about it for a second. It says, the ark of the covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Now, we'll come back to these three items in a moment. Verse number five, and above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the what? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I'm sorry. I only heard about like six or seven of you read that with me. Maybe, maybe you don't have your Bibles. It's up there on the, on the overheads. And, and I highlighted it in yellow just, just in case you were looking for the proper words to say when I, when I asked that question. So let's try it again. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the what? Mercy, Mercy seat. Jesus Christ himself is the propitiation for our sins overshadowing the mercy seat, overshadowing the propitiation. Huh. Still, we haven't got any revelation yet, but look at what it says of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Well, we got a little bit of time tonight, so we're going to talk about them for a second. 
Let's read on. Verse number six and verse number seven. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. So he basically said what we already talked about. The priest could go into the first part, no problem. Look at verse number seven. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Tonight, I'd like to take you to ancient Israel. I'd like to bring us into the temple, into the tabernacle, into the holy place, and then through the veil into the most holy place. On the day of atonement, the day of covering, you remember last week we talked about atonement means covering, covering for sin. What they would do to cover their sin for that year is they would sacrifice a lamb, spotless, without any blemish. They would take it and they would slit its throat and they would catch the blood in a bowl. Then they would take and burn the body of that lamb and completely char it, completely burn it up. All of it was to be burned, and then they would carry the ashes outside the camp. Now, they had that blood that was still there. The high priest would come, and he would wash himself. He would go into the laver. He would wash his hands, wash his feet, make sure that he was clean because he wasn't going into the presence of God dirty with ash and with fire and with all that. No, he had to clean up. And then he would change his clothes. He would change from one set of clothes where he was performing the sacrifice to his high priestly garments. Once he had put on his clothes, he would take that bowl and he would take a branch of hyssop and he would take that and he would dip it into the blood and he would go into the sanctuary, into the holy place, and he would sprinkle it on the tabernacle. He would sprinkle it onto the articles of the temple, the lamp. He would sprinkle it onto the table of showbread. And then he would come to that censer where the incense was and he would take it and he would sprinkle it on the incense and he would wave that smoke into the presence of the Lord behind the veil where the ark of the covenant was and where the mercy seat was overshadowing the ark there he would enter into the presence of God and it was such a serious thing that they had bells on the bottom of his garment so that if they didn't hear the sound of him walking around in there and the bells jingling, they knew that he had offended God and dropped over dead. They would even tie a rope around his ankle so that they didn't have to enter into the presence of God and they themselves offend God and die. They could pull him out. And so this was a very serious thing. Why? Because he was taking care of his own sin as well as the sin of the entire nation. And so here he was with the blood, and he would take that hyssop, and he would dip it in the blood, and he would sprinkle it onto the mercy seat seven times. Now remember, the mercy seat was above the ark. And above the mercy seat was the presence of God, the glory of God. Some have referred to it as the Shekinah glory of God. It was the the presence of God. And and if you notice, there was no lampstand in the second part. There was no lampstand behind the veil. See, God's presence illuminated that room, I believe. Simply because God was watching over what was taking place. And here God is seated on his throne, the mercy seat. And beneath God, there the blood is sprinkled. Why? Why would they do that? What is this a picture of? Well, you remember those three items that we talked about? Let's take a look at them real quick, okay? We're not going to take too much time, but you've got to understand these three items to understand what is really taking place. There were three items that we see. First one was the jar of manna. You notice that there was a jar of manna that was placed there. Second thing was Aaron's staff that had budded. And the third thing that we find was the Ten Commandments. Let's take a look at the first one. Jar of manna. Well, what is that all about? Well, you find out that in the book of Exodus, the children of Israel had come out into the wilderness. And here they are, they're, they're, they're going through the wilderness, and, and they realize, you know what? We haven't eaten in a while. It's been a little while. We, we had some water, but we had to complain to get it. 
And, and now there's no food, and Moses doesn't seem to be letting up. He doesn't seem to be stopping. Almost like dads on a vacation were trying to make good time, you know, and the kids are in the back screaming, I want to go to the bathroom. I need to stretch my leg. No, we're going to get there. Be quiet, you know, right? And, and so the children of Israel are following Moses, and they start to complain. They start to say, hey, what are you going to feed us? Uh, uh, did you bring us out here in the desert to die? And so what does Moses do? Moses goes before the Lord, and the Lord says, okay, I'll feed them. Don't worry about it. Tomorrow when they wake up, there's going to be something there, and it's a provision that I'm giving to them. I, I, I'm going to feed them. It's all right, Moses. Don't worry about it. Mo I'm, I'm paraphrasing, by the way. Moses tells the children of Israel about it. They come out the next morning, and there on the ground is what? This little fine layer of little, little things, and they pick them up, and they, hmm, hmm, right? And, and they gather up, and they say, what is it? Manna. Manna means, what is it? And so they gather it up, and, and you know, they, they, they gathered for their family, and whatever portion they gathered, that was enough for their family. The provision of God. He who gathered much didn't gather too much. He who gathered a little didn't gather too little. They had enough for each day. God was providing for them every day. Now, let me ask you a question. If God was leading the children of Israel through the wilderness and he had not yet commanded them to stop and eat or shown them where food was, would God have allowed the people that he was taking into the promised land to waste away and die? No. God would have provided for them. The Bible says that even though they were wandering in the wilderness, that their sandals didn't wear out, their garments didn't get holes in them, and all of them came out, and there was none feeble among Israel. Well, if God could supernaturally sustain leather on sandals and, and, and the garments that they were wearing and that he could heal them and, and make them so that their body was sustained and there was none feeble among Israel, do you think they really needed food or did they really need God? And yet, because it didn't come in the package that they thought it should, they complained. And now here God says, okay, I want you to take a jar of that manna, Exodus chapter 16, you can read it for yourself. And he says, I want you to take a jar of that and I want you to set it in the ark of the testimony before me. So when God looks at that ark, when God looks down and he sees that ark, he sees that there was a rejection of his provision. God already knew what he was going to do. God already had it in mind. He could have taken them into the promised land and if they never ate one morsel of food, God could have sustained their bodies. And yet they complained, they rejected his provision and asked for food and therefore God fed them. And now he places that as a testimony of what took place in the ark. Second thing, Aaron's staff that had budded. You say, what's that all about? Well, you find the story in the book of Numbers and we're not, we don't have time to go there tonight. But in the book of Numbers, chapter number 17, you find out that here the children of Israel have just gone through some pretty traumatic experiences. There were some guys that, that staged a rebellion. They were trying to rebel against Moses. While they were rebelling, Moses said, get away from them. The ground opens up and swallows these guys up and closes up after them and their entire family, all their stuff, it all gets swallowed up in the ground. That's scary. And so the nation of Israel has just seen these guys who tried to rebel they saw them get swallowed up and their families and all their stuff. And the very next thing they do is they say, who appointed Moses to be the leader? Now, if that was me, and I saw somebody come against someone else and the ground swallowed them up, I'd have been like, hey, Moses, can I shine your shoes? You, you know what, I, 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 can, I, can I give you a massage, man? You, you've been, you know, carrying that rod around for a long time. You, your shoulders look like they've been, you know. Come, no, let me just, get, just sit over here. I'll take care of things. You, you want some more manna? I'll go, I will go and get some of mine. I don't need it. Thirsty? I'll go find some water. See, but they didn't do that. They looked at Moses and they started to complain. Who made Moses? Who, who, who appointed his brother Aaron? What is this nepotism stuff? What is, what is this family? I mean, what's going on here? And they start to complain once again. So the Lord speaks with Moses and says, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and get a staff from each of the heads of the tribes, the 12 tribes, all right? So there's 
12 staffs. And he says, I want you to grab Aaron's staff. And he's the head of the tribe of Levi, the Levites, right? So I want you to get his staff. I want you to put it in the mix, okay? And write everybody's name on their staff so that you can read it, okay? Get your Sharpie out. Again, I'm paraphrasing. And he says, I want you to write on those staffs and make sure that we know whose is whose. Because by tomorrow morning, I'm going to let you know who I've chosen to be the leader. And so here they take all these sticks together, and they, they, they take all the staffs, and they, they place them up before the Lord, before the tent of meeting. And they lay them all out, and they make sure everybody knows, okay, that's Aaron's, that's the tribe of Judah, that's the tribe of Benjamin, right? And they, they got all the tribes laid out in front of, of the Lord. The next morning, they come back out, and they come to see who the Lord has chosen as their leader. And they take a look at all the staffs, okay, that's same, 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 11 times, until they get to Aaron's staff. But it doesn't look much like a staff anymore. And the reason why is because it has started to sprout. It, it's come alive. There's leaves coming off of it. There's, there's branches that have come off of it. There's, there's flowers that had budded and they had grown ripe almonds. Now, in case there was any question in the children of Israel's minds who the Lord had chosen, God didn't just make it sprout, didn't make it just grow leaves, didn't make it just flower and bud, but no, he had to put some ripe almonds on there just to make sure that they knew that God doesn't do anything halfway and his decision is final. Amen. So they took that staff and the Lord said, I want you to lay it up in the testimony of the ark before me. And so they took that and they laid it up in there next to the golden pot that contained the manna. What is that symbolizing? Well, they had first rejected God's provision, and now they had rejected God's leadership. God knew how to lead them. God knew what he was doing. And in rejecting Moses and Aaron, they didn't reject Moses and Aaron. They rejected God and his leadership. So he said, I want you to lay that up in the ark before me. Third thing, we're going to end with this tonight. Third thing for tonight, there was the golden pot that had the manna, there was Aaron's staff that had budded, and finally there was the Ten Commandments. Now, you guys know about the Ten Commandments. Moses up on the mountain, he gets the Ten Commandments, and he comes down and he delivers to the children of Israel the law of God. He gives them these Ten Commandments. They had to memorize them. They had to know them. They had to talk about them to their families, talk about them to their kids. And this is a simple one for you and I because if the golden pot that had the manna was a rejection of his provision and Aaron's staff that had budded was a symbol of his leadership, then the Ten Commandments was his law. The Bible says you break one part of it, you've broken all of it. Therefore, God wanted to lay all these items up in the Ark of the Covenant. And when he looked down from his seat, and he looked down at that Ark of the Testimony, what did he see? He saw a rejection of his provision. He saw a rejection of his leadership. And he saw a rejection of his law. That's why the blood had to be applied to the mercy seat. That's why they had to go in and purify everything. It was because we had all sinned and fall short of the glory of God and we had a need of the blood in innocent life given for a guilty one so that when the blood is applied God no longer looks down and sees that rejection but he sees the blood of the innocent one given for the sins we're going to stop right there tonight we'll continue next week hey I want to talk to some of you guys before we leave so everybody listen up but he tune everything else out because this is the most important part of the service for some of you that are in here. I want to make sure that nothing distracts you, so don't get up, don't walk around during this time. Just focus in and let the Lord speak to you. When I ask you a question, and I want you to answer the question in your heart, no, 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 the answer, but you and God. Here's the question. What makes you think you're going to heaven? A lot of times people don't have a problem saying they're not going to hell. No one wants to go to hell. No one's rejoicing, yay, I get to go there. No one thinks it's a party. We know it's a place of eternal torment. We don't want to go there. We don't want to be there. So what makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, you know, uh, 
guy, I, I think I'm going to go to heaven because, um, you know, I, I was really a good person. I, I used to be a bad person, but I've changed my behavior, and now I've done a lot of good things. You know, you're talking about sin, and yeah, I messed up, but I, I changed my behavior, and now I've been a good person, helped people out, been nice to my neighbor, gave my money to charities, and therefore God's going to see my, my good things that I've done, and he's going to let me into heaven. God lets good people into heaven. Problem with that statement is that nowhere in the Bible does it say God lets good people into heaven. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible does it say God lets good people into heaven. You're not going to get to heaven just by being good. You can't be good enough. Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, well, his name is Jesus. The Bible says that if we compare our goodness to God's goodness, it's like filthy rags. What does that mean? That means it's going to be thrown out. Can't get to heaven just by being good. Some of you might be thinking, well, you know what? I was raised in church, though. And my parents told me we were Christians growing up. I, I think I'm going to go to heaven because I was raised in church and my parents told me we were Christians. I was baptized as a child. Parents hung a cross or maybe a St. Christopher around your neck. And, and they took you to religious classes like Sabbath school, Sunday school, catechism class. You know, not any other religion, not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. You're born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America gets to go to heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church, you get to go to heaven. Nor in the Bible say because your parents tell you you're Christians that that makes you a Christian, you get to go to heaven too. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry, go to religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, that you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. And I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says that America is a Christian nation and everybody born in America gets to go to heaven. God's not looking at our lives and saying, oh, they're not anything else, so I'll just lump them into the category of being a Christian headed for heaven. And come on, tonight, let's talk. I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. If that's how you think you're going to get into heaven, then you're not saved. And you're not going to make it to heaven. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, but not only when I was a child did I go to church, but here I am sitting in church right now. I mean, I, I, I'm sitting in church right in front of you, Pastor. I, I, I consider myself to be a Christian headed for heaven. Well, that's great that you're sitting here tonight, but... Could you show that to me in the Bible where it says that because you sit in church and call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian headed for heaven? It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say sit in church and call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Any more than you can go down to the ocean, sit in the water, call yourself a fish, and that makes you a fish. Come on. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, oh, but you know what? My, my, my last church, I got involved. Therefore, I'm a Christian headed for heaven because I've been involved in church. You know, I, I helped out my last church, carried the pastor's Bible, sang in the choir. People thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. Once again, I'm glad you did those things. But could you show that to me in the Bible? Could you show me in the Bible where it says that because you're helping out, carrying the pastor's Bible, singing in the choir, people think of you as a leader, and you get a membership card that you get to go to heaven? It doesn't work like that. I don't see anywhere in the Bible God's looking for your membership card to a church. It doesn't work like that. Come on, let's love you enough to tell you the truth tonight. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, you're not going to make it. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, but wait a second, I know God. I know about Easter and the resurrection. Celebrate Christmas every year of my life. Sing the songs. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor. You talked about that Old Testament stuff. I know that. I know God. Doesn't that make me a Christian headed for heaven? Well, if you've read your Bible, you would know the Bible says demons know who Jesus is. They believe that he's the son of God, and yet they're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the son of God, and yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about some mental ascent towards God. But rather, this is about your heart. God has always been after your heart. Jesus said it like this to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, hold on a second, because Nicodemus was a good guy. Nicodemus was the leader of his church called the synagogue. Nicodemus held to the strictest form of the law. I mean, this guy, if anybody would have looked at of an example of good works, it would have been him. I mean, he could quote scripture. He could debate the scripture. He could preach the scripture. He could sing the scripture. How many of us could do that? And yet when he comes to Jesus and asks him about how to get into the kingdom of heaven, Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, you're doing great. Just keep doing what you're doing and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. But rather, what does he say? 
He says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term and raked it through the coals. Pop culture's made it into their new thing. But listen, this is not about what society or pop culture says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, here's what it means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus Christ. And if you haven't yet done that, love you enough to tell you the truth, you're not going to make it. And if you were to die tonight, you wouldn't go to heaven, but you would end up in hell. But listen, it doesn't have to be that way. In a moment, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I'm going to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus and to give him all of your heart and all of your life. I'm going to just do like this. One, two, three. And when I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang! That's your opportunity. When you hear that sound, bang! Just to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. Hold on, bud. We'll do it all together, man. That's exciting. People are already getting their hands ready to go up for Jesus. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, but wait a second. If I raise my hand, I might be embarrassed. People might see me. Uh Uh-huh, you might be embarrassed. Get over it. Because isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever? Think of the trade-off. Come on, will you give them all of your heart and will you give them all of your life? It's all or nothing with Jesus. Jesus said in the book of Revelation, the third chapter, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying, lukewarm? What does that mean? Well, it means a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. And God is something in your life, but he's not everything. Listen, if that's your relationship with God, then look out, because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, your call, your choice. All across the auditorium, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, get ready to get your hand up and then tell an usher right afterwards or come into the church service if you can. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this? Never given God all your heart. Never given God all your life. I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. You can get right with God in this safe and friendly place. All across the auditorium, back in the families, wherever you're at, come on, get ready to get your hands up. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two. Three, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. Thank you, there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four. Thank you, God bless you. Four wise people already. Five, thank you. Six, thank you. Seven, eight, God bless you guys. Nine, I got you up in the back. Anybody else real quick? Uh, Is that one back in the family? Nine, ten, thank you. God bless you. Anybody on this side? Eleven up there, thank you in that family room. God bless you guys. Anybody else real quick? There's eleven wise people. Anybody else, you need to give God all your heart, need to give God all of your life. Real quick, just pop it up, just pop it up. Where are you at? Just lift it up high if I don't see it. Got you right there. Thank you. Thank you. There's 12. There's a dozen wise people. Anybody else? You know you need to do this. Come on, if you're sitting there wondering if you should, you should. Thank you. There's 13. Anybody else? Real quick. Real quick. Number 14, you're sitting there wondering if you should. Come on, yeah. You should do this. Go ahead. Just lift your hand up real quick. Anybody else? Anybody else? Real quick. They're pointing this way. Up here. Back there. Everywhere. All right. Cool. Everybody's pointing at everybody else. All right, so I'll just count like 23 there. Praise God. Hey, all 14 of you, if you're number 15, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible. Get a hold of a friend if you need a friend. I want you in a moment as we stand and sing a song to get your stuff, get in the aisle, and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that till we get you down here, all right? So let's all stand and welcome them. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you just come right now. Just come and make your way to the front. All All right, they're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. All All right, they're still coming. Let's give them a hand. From the family rooms, you want to bring your kids? Bring them on down. Come on. Come on. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. You're all I want. 
All right, they're still coming. Come on, we'll wait for you. You can come too. Just make your way to the front right now. All right, all right, everybody. Hey, congratulations. This is the best decision of your entire life, all right? You didn't come to me. You came to God. The Bible says no one comes to God except by the Holy Spirit. So you didn't respond to a message or to anything else. The Holy Spirit was drawing you, all right? Now listen, God doesn't come into your heart because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you need him. He, he comes into your heart when you invite him in. So I want to introduce you to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joe. Pastor Joe's a really good guy. He's going to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, and you're going to be born again, okay? Then he's going to give you some free stuff. Everybody loves free stuff. We like giving away free stuff, all right? So that's a great relationship already, okay? A couple of little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to get your bearings, find out what to do next in your walk with God, okay? Easy to read, and they'll just help you to see, okay, now that I'm a Christian, what do I do next? Third thing he's gonna do with you guys is he's gonna introduce you to another friend. We call them spiritual personal trainers. Basically, it's a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. You heard of a physical trainer who helps you get strong physically. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend in church who will help you to get strong spiritually. He'll describe how it works, he'll introduce you to that friend, and then he'll let you come right back into the church service, okay? The people you came with, they'll wait for you. If you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Joe right this way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you.